So first, welcome everyone to uh, this webinar on Fluorospot today. Uh, my name is Tyler Salmbari, and I am a product manager here at Mabtech. And we're also joined by our uh, panelists, uh, Niklas Albori and Christian Smedman. Uh, and also we have Renata as this uh, empty bubble here who's helping with some tech support behind the scenes. Um, so uh, Christian and Niklas will join us a little bit later uh, for the uh, live Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, but so for now, we'll start with the actual presentation. So let me share the screen here. There we go. And can I get a thumbs up? Okay, good. Looks like everything's working. Um, but yeah, so welcome. And today we're going to be talking a lot about uh, Fluorospot with the basics, different applications where you can use it, as well as some troubleshooting that we've uh, encountered um, and get a lot of questions about in different steps. Um, so a little background about me, just so you know, um, I have a PhD in vaccine immunology and did quite a lot of uh, Fluorospot during my PhD, made a lot of mistakes, and then got a lot of help from Mabtech. Uh, so hopefully we've been able to sort of combine a lot of uh, good stuff that we've learned over the years and put into this presentation. And just a little bit of background about us here at Mabtech and sort of why we're even doing a webinar uh, is because we really want to help our fellow scientists reach new frontiers and answer really cool uh, research questions by providing really good immunoassays and instruments to do that. And a lot of our products are used in different vaccine research, cancer and new, uh, immunotherapy, veterinary research, infectious diseases, autoimmune disease and transplantation, and even a lot more. Uh, so, I mean, that's the sort of whole point. Like we really want to help you all succeed. And so one of the ways of doing that is uh, putting together one of these webinars. So today we'll go through a little bit about, uh, just a little bit about the assay itself and different applications when you might use it instead of other immunoassays. And then the majority of the presentation will go and look, uh, take a deep dive into the sort of the step-by-step uh, think how we do things here at Mabtech uh, and how and common questions that sort of come up during each step. So you'll see each of these symbols uh, on the slide and that's when you know that that's where we are sort of in the presentation in that step. And then finally, the last 15 or 20 minutes, we'll have a live Q&A with our floor spot experts. Uh, so take the opportunity to write your questions either in the, in the chat or with the Q&A button. Um, and if all else fails, we also will, uh, you can, uh, we'll unmute you and we can ask your questions yourselves if you raise your hand. Uh, but we'll do all of that uh, more towards the end. But during this, uh, during the presentation, feel free to already submit your questions there on the side. And just so everyone knows, this is being recorded and we'll be able to put this up online later for you to watch as well. But yeah, so let's start and talk a little bit about fluorospots. Um, I mean, fluorospot, it's, and a lot of these different immunoassays, they really are good in complementing each other and really uh, can be used together to really increase and enhance your immune profiling. Uh, so just a little bit of background about these different immunoassays that are most commonly used in different immunological research. I mean, ELISAs are commonly used to look at the concentration of analytes or multiplex to look at multiple analytes uh, in solution. So whether that's a serum sample, plasma, or um, cell stimulation media, things like that. Uh, so here you're usually are always uh, measuring the concentration of the analyte in a solution. Flow cytometry is another really good one uh, where you're looking at the frequency of cells and frequency of these producing cells. Sometimes if you're looking at different, uh, different chemokines or uh, cytokine expression as well. And then L-spot and fluorospot, you're looking at the cells and the number of spot forming cells in a sample that are responding to a certain target. And, but so what is fluorospot? Uh, a lot of you, you have probably heard of Elispot, uh, where you look at a single analyte, and fluorospot is really sort of the next step in that, in looking at multiple analytes in the same well, uh, using fluorescence detection systems. So each spot you see here is a footprint of a single cell, where each color is a different analyte. Uh, and it, it's a very sensitive assay, so we always like to say that if one cell responds, you'll find it with fluorospot. And this is what a typical fluorospot readout will look like. Uh, you can look it up to four colors at the same time in the same well. Uh, so with four different analytes, that means that you can look at 15 different secretory profiles, whether it's quadruple producing cells, triple producing cells, double produce, producing cells, or single producing cells. Uh, so it really enhances and adds this sort of multiplex layer to the L-spot uh, assay. 
which makes it so that you can really look at these polyfunctional cells and define these cell populations, find these really nuanced differences between uh, maybe different vaccination formulations or immunotherapies, uh, because you can also assess cytokines and immunoglobulins. Uh, so it really makes a, it's a really nice assay to use in these different areas. And there might be some times when you would want to use fluorospot instead of maybe ELISA or multiplex assays. Uh, and this is when you would re really need high sensitivity. Uh, and this is because the analyte is captured at secretion, which really increases the sensitivity. Uh, there's no dilution effect of the analyte. So if you're taking it from a serum sample and diluting it with different ELISA diluent or these multiplex or the oh, diluent that's included in these different multiplex kits. Uh, and also the analyte's not consumed during the uh, during secretion. Uh, so since it's captured onto the plate, so you can really see it throughout the entire secretory process. And so here the readout will be the number of responding cells instead of the concentration of the analyte. Similarly, there might be some times when fluorospot would be really good to use maybe instead of flow cytometry or in combination with flow cytometry. Um, maybe you're doing some more phenotypic analysis with uh, different fax panels. And then you, with flow cytom or with the fluorospot, you can really look at the sort of more functional assays. And this is when you would need more higher sensitivity to look at those functional profiles. Uh, because the, cap the analyte is captured at secretion, this increases the sensitivity and is also captured throughout the stimulation. So you can also detect those cells that are responding early, as well as the cells that are responding later on during the stimulation process. Uh, and one of the biggest advantages of using fluorospot uh, over flow cytometry here is, uh, is that kinetics of the cytokine releases are rele irrelevant. So with these intracellular cytokine stainings, uh, you really can only stimulate the cells for about six hours uh, before it starts getting cytotoxic. And there's a lot of analytes that aren't going to be produced already at six hours. Uh, and also, like I said, you're going to be able to uh, pick up those early responders and late responders. So you're really looking at this relevant uh, physiologically relevant secretion uh, and not clogged up production like you'll do with flow cytometry. And here the readouts can be, like I said, the number of secreting cells instead of the number of producing cells. Uh, and a big advantage is when you're looking at B cells uh, because the detection of antibody secreting cells is much more straightforward in Ellis spot and fluorospot compared to flow cytometry. Uh, so those are a little bit of the different applications and where you would use fluorospot. Uh, but now let's really dive deep into the step-by-step -step and really go and look, uh, really go into each step. Uh, so first what you'll do is you're gonna be coding uh, these special uh, 96 roll plates uh, with the, uh, the capture antibodies onto this special PVDF membrane. And PVDF, which uh, is polyvinylene difluoride membrane, uh, it has really high binding capacity. And when you look under the microscope, you can see it almost looks like a sponge, which really increases the surface area. So it allows for a lot more binding of that uh, capture antibody, which really increases or improves your data. Uh, and these membranes are also designed to be low fluorescent. And so they're called IPFL membranes. And these are included in all of our fluorospot kits. Uh, so you don't have to worry about like with Ellispot, sometimes you have, um, it's a matter of taste if you're choosing white plates or clear plates. Uh, it's all the same fluorospot uh, plates that are included in our kits. And so this leads to like a common question that we get during the uh, coding stage is if you can use Ellispot plates for your fluorospot. And the short answer is no. Uh, you really need these uh, specially designed low fluorescent IPFL plates uh, to use instead, just so you're not getting any of this autofluorescent uh, uh, artifacts that can maybe pop up with Ellispot plates. Um, but so now you have your plates and you're ready for the next step. And so first what you have to do is you're going to be, be pre-treating the uh, uh, fluorospot plates. So to do that, you add 35% uh, ethanol solution to activate the membrane, and this makes it more hydrophilic, so it increases the binding capacity even more. And so when you add the ethanol to the wells, you'll actually see small, um, a small color change from like this really white opaque to a little bit more of a gray color, and that is indicative of that the uh, membrane has been activated. And this is a really important step because it really does increase and uh, improve the binding capacity of the of the membrane to the capture antibodies. So you see here, we have two wells that uh, had no ethanol treatment. And interferon gamma is okay. They, they're not really great spots, but IL-2 is completely obliterated without having the ethanol. Uh, so it really is an important step. And you can see here the linear uh, relationship between adding uh, or the amount of added antibody and the amount of bound antibody after this ethanol treatment versus no ethanol treatment. Uh, so it's really an important part uh, before you do anything else. 
so after you've activated the membrane, the uh, ethanol should only be on for about a minute. And then you'll toss that and then you'll wash with uh, sterile water. Uh, and then after the plate has been washed, then you're going to add your coating antibodies. And in most of our, most of our coating antibodies are recommended to be coated at about 15 micrograms per milliliter, which is kind of a high concentration compared to if you're used to working with ELISAs where you're using one to five micrograms per milliliter. Uh, but we've really found that increasing uh, the amount of coating antibody really improves the spot quality. Uh, you can sort of see here, like if it's a lower concentration of coating antibody, it's spreading them out across the membrane, which is going to give more diffuse spots. You might be even missing some uh, important cells. Uh, so really using that 15 micrograms per milliliter or whatever is recommended in the protocol, of course, uh, is quite important because this is going to increase your capture efficiency, which leads to better spots and ultimately better data. And this leads to another question that we usually get is how long can I coat the plate? And typically plates are coated overnight in the fridge. So between two to eight degrees Celsius. Uh, and so when that coating solution is added onto the plate, you can wrap it in parafilm or aluminum foil. And you can see here on the fridge, uh, just stick them anywhere in the fridge nice, on a nice level surface. Um, and that wrapping is to help uh, prevent evaporation and contamination. Uh, but a nice thing is that you can really coat the, have the coating solution uh, left in the plates for up to seven days. So this is really nice if you don't want to come in and work on the weekends. You can do all of your coating on Friday and come in Monday morning and ready for your floor spot. Uh, and really quick before we go into the next steps, uh, one of the questions that we get a lot, because there are a lot of these washing steps uh, in floor spot, is how you should wash and how you should empty your plates. And washing can be done either manually or autom automatically with automatic plate washers. Uh, if you're doing a manual washing, using these multi-channel pipettes are really good, or these multi-channel dispenser pipettes are also really nice to use. Uh, if you have the luxury of having an automated plate washer, uh, a lot of times they'll have an L-spot setting, uh, which makes sure that the nozzle doesn't go too far down into the L-spot wells, since they're a little bit shallower than typical ELISA plates. Uh, but you might also be able to adjust that manually as well. Uh, so this is um, just an example of one that is often used. And then when you're emptying the plates, uh, if you're doing a manual washing, uh, just having a little bin like uh, you see, like a little waste bin in the hood. Uh, I like to coat mine with paper towels just to produce splashing, uh, but that's just a simple way of decanting uh, out the solution or the cells into that uh, basin. But yeah, so now you've coated the plate and you're ready to, and you've uh, now washed it and now it's ready uh, for cell addition. So what you're going to do is you're going to add uh, cells in the presence of a stimuli um, to the plate, and they're going to be incubated to enable analyte secretion. Uh, so really quick, what we'll run through here in these next few slides um, is you, first you're going to block the plate with media, and then you're going to add your stimuli and then cells and incubate at 37 degrees uh, for a specific amount of time. And you should always use triplicates when possible, uh, especially when you're wanting to sort of define what's a positive response and negative response. There's a statistical method called uh, the DFR method, which we have a whole blog post about on our website that you should go check out and read. Uh, and it really has a nice uh, template where you can upload your data and that'll sort of help you decide what a good cutoff can be there with that uh, method. Uh, so that's why we recommend using triplicates because the DFR method only works with triplicates. Uh, and then you're gonna be wrapping your plates in aluminum foil. And a tip here is to not ever stack the plates just for even heat distribution um, uh, for the cells themselves. And also when you're sort of handling the plate after, you, after you've added cells, it's really important that you're moving the plate slowly to the incubator and avoid shaking during incubation. I know a lot of incubators sometimes have sort of built-in shaking functions. Uh, just make sure those, offs, those are off so that the cells aren't being like shuffled around uh, and maybe causing several spots or a little tail uh, that you would see during development. So this comes to another common question that we get is what kind of media should be used in fluorospot? And it's really whatever media your cells are happiest in, um, because the happy cells are going to give you better spots. So our in-house cell culture medium that we use for quality control purposes and also in R&D uh, is a simple RPMI-1640 supplemented with 10% FCS uh, and all of the other good stuff with l glute hippies, and penstrep. Um, but an important thing is to really just use the same media throughout the entire protocol. So from the time you're blocking the plate, uh, also to the cell incubation that that same media is used so that the cells are uh, not being sort of shocked when a new media is coming into play. And a tip here is to, if you're supplementing with FCS or any sort of serum, um, although we don't recommend using human serum, 
uh, but that we could have a whole another webinar about. Uh, but if different FCS batches uh, can affect your assay, so we really recommend testing each new batch before you use it with actual precious samples. Um, and then another kind of question that we get uh, about fluorospot is what kind of cells can be used in fluorospot? And it's really basically any kind of cells that are secreting proteins, as long as they're alive and well. Uh, but I would say the most common, uh, the common sources of cells that are used in fluorospot uh, from humans would be PBMCs and then in splenocytes and mice. Um, so, I mean, you can isolate these from either buffy coats or uh, blood draws. You can get them from uh, different cell cultures that have been treated in different ways. Uh, you can isolate them from different organs like spleens or, or lymph nodes as well. Uh, as long as you have a high uh, viability of these cells, uh, they should work really nicely in fluorospot. So we generally recommend a vi minimum viability of uh, at least 90%, uh, just to make sure that the actual assay is working nicely and you can really rely on the data there. And uh, we have some really nice uh, uh, protocols about how we isolate cells, how we freeze cells, and how we thaw cells. Uh, all available on our website. Uh, so take a look at those and maybe compare with your current setup if you're having issues with viability uh, in your lab and maybe sort of see how we do things here at MapTech because we usually always get around 95% viability or higher uh, with these methods that we've really been able to optimize over the years. Uh, so feel free to take a look at those on our website later as well. Uh, the next sort of thing to think about during the cell incubation step is picking the right cell number. Uh, so it's important to count your cells and know your cell viability. And once you know that, and you're not really sure where to go next, uh, we recommend trying around 250,000 cells per well. That gives a nice monolayer on the fluorospot plate, uh, so the cells aren't going to be overlapping, but they're still close enough together that, they, um, that they're happy. And in positive controls, or if you have a sample or a stimulant that you're expecting high frequency of responders, uh, 50,000 cells or less can uh, be adequate there as well. And important to note, and we'll talk a little bit more about B cells at the end of the presentation here, but some cells require pre-stimulation. Uh, so we'll cover this more in detail later as well. Uh, but when you're handling your cells, avoid vortexing them. Gentle, gentle pipette, uh, pipetting is recommended just to reduce the stress on these cells. So now you've picked the right cell number, and now it's time to pick the right stimulation. Uh, so a lot of different stimuli can be used for fluorospot assays. Probably the most common are going to be different peptide pools, um, especially if you're doing a lot of epitope mapping and looking at different, um, or after a vaccine response, like how are they responding to this portion of the protein? Uh, so a lot of these different pools are used, uh, but also monoclonal antibodies are used as well as synthetic and naturally occurring compounds. Uh, so, I mean, this would be for your experimental setup, uh, but then you should also have some positive, negative, and background controls. Uh, so these positive can be polyclonal stimulators like PHA or antigen uh, specific ones as well. Uh, sort of you could uh, look like a SF pool, for example, uh, to give that sort of, because you should get a response out of that. And that indicates that the assay is functioning well. And then you can also have your negative controls, which would be your cells without any stimuli. And this would indicate if your cells are spontaneously secreting that specific analyte. And then your uh, background is also good to have where you have no cells, but all the other reagents to make sure that they're not inducing false spots. So now you've got your cell number, you've got your stimuli, you're ready to go and plate the cells. Uh, there are some things to think about here though, uh, how to properly add your cells and stimuli to the fluorospot plate. Uh, so if you're adding them separately, we always recommend to add your stimulus first, followed by your cells. If you do it the opposite way, this is a question that we commonly get in uh, from people asking why their wells look like this, the sort of donut or crescent moon shape. And this is often because there was something added after they added the cells. So if you're adding 50 microliters of the stimulus after you've added your cells, you can imagine that all of the cells are sort of getting pushed to the side uh, after that addition of the stimulus. Uh, so this is a really common uh, mistake that we see. So generally always add your cells after. Or what you can do is you can first mix your stimulus and cell stocks, maybe in a separate vial, or I always like to use separate 96 well plates where I would do all my dilutions and uh, combinations and then transfer it over to a fluorospot plate. Uh, and that'll reduce that sort of crescent moon or donut shape that you could see sometimes in your results. So as a rule of thumb, don't add anything after your cells and you should be good to go. But now when we go into the next step uh, during the analyte capture, uh, so now, during the incubation period, 
the different secreted analytes are going to be bound by the capture antibodies that are surrounded the activating cells. Uh, so an important thing to consider here with analyte capture is knowing your timing. Uh, and you need to con consider the kinetics of secretion of the specific protein of interest uh, when you're thinking of the optimal cell incubation time. Uh, so because different analytes have different kinetics, uh, and just a little side note here, I mean, with fluorospot, the kinetics of the secreted analytes don't matter like in facts, uh, because you're going to be able to detect these early responders that are already secreting here and secreting here, as well as that next analyte that's coming up that's secreting here and here as well. Um, so, I mean, for example, uh, some analytes like granzyme B, uh, they have a, like a 72 hour, or only after 48 hours are, gonna, are the cells going to start secreting granzyme B, whereas uh, interferon gamma can already start secreting after 12 hours. Uh, so if you have these two different um, kinetics, you should always generally choose the analyte or choose the incubation time for the analyte that takes a longer time to release that. So uh, the long, that has the longer incubation time because uh, that shouldn't have any negative effect on the sort of quicker analyte. Uh, you might want to adjust cell numbers uh, for that quicker analyte, just so that you're not getting a sort of carpet of interferon gamma producing cells. Uh, but you can always consult your kit's protocol for recommended cell numbers, as well as uh, recommended incubation times. But generally, when you're looking at these multiple analytes, just choose the longer incubation time and you should be set. Uh, another thing to consider uh, during this an analyte capture step is a thing called capture effects or cytokine absorption effects. Uh, so when you have capture antibodies that have different specificities coded together, uh, the capture of one cytokine might affect the secretion of other cytokines, uh, which is what we call capture effects. Uh, so for example, like with IL-2 here, uh, IL-2 capture antibodies might reduce in a reduced activation of T cells uh, as we're capturing a lot of the IL-2 that's being secreted, uh, which is reducing the amount of IL-2 available for the other cells. Uh, so luckily, uh, this capture effect can be counteracted by adding an anti-CD28 uh, monoclonal antibody that gives a co-stimulatory signal to the T cells, and this can sort of re restore the cytokine secretion uh, so that you would actually get that granzyme B uh, secretion later on. Uh, and we have done a lot of testing of the different analytes together. And on our website, we have an analyte combination table. So you can see what ones that we recommend uh, to be run together and ones that we've seen major capture effects that can't be counteracted with anti-CD28. So take a look at that. Uh, but if your specific analyte combination isn't in that table or you're unsure, uh, you can also investigate these capture effects uh, on your own uh, by uh, setting up your own fluorospot experiment, where you'll have some wells coated with single capture antibodies, and then you'll have some wells that are coated with um, a mixture of the capture antibodies. And then you'll be able to compare the number of spot forming units and the different signal conditions and the mixture condition. And if you see a difference, then it's probably indicative of that there's a capture effect. So then the next step would be assessing uh, the uh, compensatory effect of an adding anti-CD28 uh, to that stimulation cocktail. And then you'd be able to compare before and, or with or without anti-CD28 to see if you got a recovery uh, of the stimulation of that specific analyte. Uh, but I mean, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. The threshold to contact us with questions is extremely low, and we're so happy to be able to answer questions. Uh, so really feel free to contact us if there's an analyte combination that you don't see uh, and that you would like on our website. Uh, so yeah, so now we've gone through the analyte capture. All of everything is uh, captured on the plate. And now you're gonna finish the sandwich assay by adding the detection antibodies. Uh, so the cells are removed and a mixture of the tagged uh, labeled ant or biotinylated antibodies are added to the mix or added to the wells. Uh, so here you're gonna dump your cells or you can also recover your cells for some downstream analyses. Uh, I know several researchers that have done this. And an important thing to consider is that when you're uh, picking the cells up out of the uh, fluorospot plate, to make sure that you don't hit the bottom of the membrane. Uh, because if you do hit the bottom of the membrane, that can make these grooves, uh, which then can be or counted as artifacts in your lab label an uh, later analysis. So really just be careful to never hit the bottom of the well when you're recovering these cells. Or if you're not doing any downstream analysis, you can just simply decant them into a waste bin. Because uh, like I said, you're detecting the footprint of the cells, not the actual cells themselves in the fluorospot plate. And our kits have either one or two-step detection systems. Uh, the majority are these two-step detection systems, but we also have a couple of analytes that you can do a single uh, step detection where the detection antibody is directly conjugated to a fluorophore. 
Uh, but generally, we really like this two-step detection system to really help enhance the signal and really find those uh, rare cells there. So after the addition of the detection antibodies, then if you're doing a two-step system, you're going to add uh, the addition of the fluorophore labeled secondary detection reagents uh, so that you can actually read your plate later. Oops, let's start over again. Uh, yeah, so then you're going to add these tryptavidin or anti-tag conjugates and this two-step de detection system. And after that incubation period, uh, you'll remove those reagents. And the final addition that you're going to add is this fluorospot enhancer solution, which is a small amount at 50 microliters just for 15 minutes. And this is uh, really helps enhance the fluorescent signal uh, from these different fluorophores. Uh, but an important thing here is that after that incubation period is to really get it all out of there. Um, so, I mean, really do like a nice hard decant into your waste bin, and then you can take a stack of paper towels and really hit uh, the plate upside down against the paper towels until you stop seeing uh, droplets from there. Uh, if there's any remaining uh, fluorospot enhancer solution in the wells, it can uh, negatively affect the data later on. Uh, so really make sure that you're getting all of it out there. Uh, and another thing to just to consider is to have a clean basin uh, to reduce the sort of autofluorescent dust particles that can maybe come up into the wells. Yeah, so now you're done with the actual assay and you're going to prepare to be able to do your analysis uh, in a fluorospot reader. So the last thing you're going to have to do in the lab is uh, you need to make sure that your plates are completely dry before the fluorospot analysis. Uh, so you'll remove this under drain and then you're going to let the plates completely dry in the dark. And this can be done overnight or if you're in a hurry, uh, you can speed up drying by placing the plate upside down uh, over the vent in the hood there. Uh, this is what I did a lot because I'm quite impatient. Uh, so this was a nice way to be able to finish your floor spot experiment and be able to go to the floor spot reader and read the plates the same day, which was nice to get right to your data. Uh, but it's really important, and I would just want to emphasize that the plates are actually completely dry. Otherwise, you'll see a lot of uh, wells that can look like this with this very sort of bright middle. And that's almost like the reflection of the LED light that's uh, activating the fluorophores there. Uh, so this is what a typical wet floor spot well looks like. So it's really important just to make sure that the wells are dry. And you can almost see it uh, when you're holding the plate. It'll go from this like gray translucent color to a really white, chalky, opaque color. So just really make sure that they're dry before the actual reading in the floor spot reader. But then finally, you've come to uh, hopefully the easiest part of the assay now is actually reading the plate and the most fun in being able to analyze your data. Uh, we generally recommend reading your plates within one week. The fluorophores are pretty stable, uh, but if you can't read it the same day, just store the plates in the dark place. Uh, a, a drawer is usually fine, uh, but just make sure to keep the lid back on so that no dust particles are sort of falling in like that and get the plates read within a week, hopefully on an iris, Mabtec Iris 2, or if you have an Iris 1 at your uh, location as well, that also works just as well. Um, and just a little bit about uh, fluorospot readers. Uh, so they really look at the spot coordinates to determine these polyfunctional cells. Uh, so you can see here, um, it's they're using these sort of X, Y coordinates to say, here's a spot secreting cytokine A, and here's a spot secreting cytokine B. And when you overlay it, you say, okay, this is a dual secreting spot. This is a polyfunctional cell here. And so the key to fluorospot is actually having really accurate spot center detection. Uh, because these sec dual secreting cells are based on spot position in the different filters, finding the center accurate, the, the spot center is uh, very key uh, because you really want to make sure that it's not two separate cells that are just really close to each other uh, that are be being counted as one cell or two cells. And we had seen a problem with a lot of uh, older readers or past readers that just weren't good at finding this exact spot center. They were based off of JPEG images. Uh, so sometimes it would miss the spot center and, uh, or it would count uh, uh, what we would consider a dual secreting cell as two separate cells and vice versa. Uh, so we went back to the drawing table and uh, with some great mathematicians at the at KTH here in Stockholm, came up with a new counting, a new algorithm for detecting these spots and implemented that into making uh, the iris. And now we have iris too, which has some new features as well. And I used this instrument a lot during my PhD. We had another reader in our uh, department and I never really got good at using this. And someone else bought the iris and put it right next to it. And it was the only instrument I ended up using for all of my fluorospots after. 
So if you have any questions or want to even try out uh, an IRIS too, uh, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and we'd be happy to set up an online demo or an in, a live demo at your own lab where you can sort of try it out yourself as well. Uh, but back to sort of getting into the nitty gritty and analyzing your data, uh, you're really in control of deciding what spots to count and not. Uh, the default settings that are in these floor spot readers are pretty good and often good enough, uh, but you still can adjust spot intensity as well as size uh, to optimize your count settings. And so like a, a way to sort of think about it is with flow cytometry in a fax panel, you use these different gating strategies where you've decided that this group of cells here and this cell in particular is going to be part of a positive gate here. In a similar manner, you would say that this spot here, you want to count and include it into your data, and you count it as a positive spot. Uh, whereas maybe this cell in this gate is considered something else or a negative spot uh, in your floor spot well. So it really is up to you to, to sort of decide and find these ultimate good threshold of what in optimizing your counting settings. And that's really it. I mean, we've done a lot of, uh, gone through a lot of details of the different steps of floor spot. Uh, but really quick, I said that I would talk a little bit about some B-cell floor spot things here at the end, which were my personal favorite. I did a lot of B-cell floor spots during my PhD, uh, because this is still considered the gold standard for looking at antigen-specific B-cells, and it's quite straightforward. Uh, so for looking at these antigen-specific uh, IgG, for example, uh, you can either coat your uh, PVDF well or your IPFL well uh, plates with the antigen itself, or you can coat it with capture IgG. And then you would detect with the, with the biotinylated antigen or a directly conjugated uh, or a tagged antigen or an antigen directly conjugated to a fluorophore. Uh, and then you can also look at the total IgG or IgA or IgM or all three of those in the same well with fluorospot. And so really quick, we'll run just through the protocol here. Uh, so here you're going to be coding either with uh, the antigen or the monoclonal cap capture antibodies on the ethanol uh, treated PVDF membrane. Then you'll add your cells and they're allowed to secrete antibodies overnight. Um, and then they'll be captured by the uh, antibodies or antigen in close proximity of the cells. And then depending on how you're doing your fluorospot assay, if you're looking antigen specific, uh, you would add, uh, in this aspect, if you were coding with the antigen, you would add the anti-IgG after. Or if you were detecting with the antigen, you would add the detection antigen that's either biotinylated or directly conjugated to the fluorophore. And then if you're looking at total IgG here, you would add the uh, the detection anti-IgG there as well. And then you would finally do your analysis in the fluorospot reader. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind though with B cells uh, is that uh, memory B cells uh, first require pre-activation and to make them uh, actually secrete antibodies so you can detect them in fluorospot. Uh, but in all of our B cell fluorospot kits, uh, we include a memory B-cell stim pack that includes a recombinant IL-2 and R848, which is a TLR agonist. Uh, and in the optimal concentrations of those with your cells for about 72 hours, uh, those memory B-cells will differentiate into antibody secreting cells. So then they can be used directly in fluorospot. Uh, so that if you're looking more at memory responses, sort of long after vaccination or infection, uh, this is a really nice method to use to be able to assess that. Uh, but you can also look at antibody secreting cells directly from the blood that were stimulated uh, in vivo by either an infection or a vaccination. So this would be more of like your plasma cells and plasma blasts. Uh, so just a little quick note here uh, to keep in mind when you're looking at B cells that you can be looking at uh, several different kinds of B cells as well, depending on your setup. Uh, but a nice thing is you can look at multiple antigens with spe uh, antigen specific B cells. Uh, so you can uh, detect with uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, antigens that are tagged with different uh, tags or fluorophores, or you can also be looking at different uh, uh, isotypes or subclasses, either antigen specific or IgG, IgA, IgM kind of thing. Uh, so it's a really nice, uh, uh, nice assay to use for looking at B cells. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is probably uh, at the end a good slide to screen capture, even though this will be put online as well. Uh, but just some tips, tricks, and best practices for uh, to keep in mind for fluorospot. Um, after you've activated the membrane with the ethanol, it's really important that the membrane doesn't dry out. Uh, so a tip here is uh, during all of these washing steps, there's usually five wash steps or uh, five rounds of washing after each step. Uh, that fifth wash, I generally would leave in the plate while I prepared the next step. And once all of those reagents were ready to be actually plated, then I would throw away that final uh, wash step so that there was no risk of the plate drying out. And if you're working with multiple plates, I mean, really find a sweet spot for you 
Um, but I think work, not working with more than three or four plates at a time can be uh, helpful in this aspect. Or if you can be multiple people in the lab and really tag team this, that's also a nice option. And when you're handling the plates, it's also good to hold the plate by the edges. Uh, so you should avoid putting uh, pressure on the bottom of the plate or the top of the plate uh, because this can damage the PVDF membrane and also maybe give some artifacts uh, during your analysis. Uh, and then it's also generally recommended to be using a multi-channel pipette uh, when you're doing either wash steps or when you're adding different reagents, uh, just that really improves your data and also makes your life a lot easier when you're working with these uh, with these assays because there are a lot of washing steps. There are a lot of moving uh, cells to different wells and things like that. So these multi-channel pipettes are very nice to use. Uh, but then using them, it's also important to pipette carefully because you don't want to touch the membrane. Uh, like I said earlier, if you touch the membrane, it can re uh, uh, it can lead to some artifacts that show up during the analysis. Uh, so especially when you're using these multi-channel pipettes, if you're using eight channel or 12 channels, I mean, that's eight pipette tips and 12 pipette tips that you have to make sure aren't touching the bottom. So just make sure that you're pipetting carefully. And also in the, when you're uh, adding reagents to the wells, making make sure that you're coating the wells evenly and avoid bubbles. Uh, if bubbles do show up, I mean, just take a pipette tip and you can pop those, but you just really wanna make sure that all of the different reagents are distributed evenly across all of the wells. Uh, otherwise you can get some weird sort of, uh, you, the spots can sort of look like they're only in half of a well and things like that. Uh, so really just make sure you get some nice even distribution of those solutions. Uh, we don't recommend using tween in your wash buffer. A lot of ELISAs do, uh, but the membrane doesn't really like tween and can lead to some uh, funny background effects. So just leave the tween out of your wash buffers. And also when you're working with DMSO, uh, like when you're resuspending your different peptide pools, those are often done uh, resuspended in DMSO. Make sure that the final concentration that is going to be in the well isn't higher than half a, half a percent. Uh, just because that can have some negative uh, effects on the data and on the membrane itself. Uh, and then another tip, I mentioned this earlier, but avoid splashing when you're decanting. So putting paper towels in the bottom of that little basin can help uh, reduce the sort of backsplash. Uh, so this was the last little tip here. So if you wanted to grab a screenshot, go ahead uh, before we go into the live Q&A in just a minute here. And for this Q&A session, uh, we have Associate Professor Niklas Albori at Stockholm University uh, and Dr. Christian Smiedman as well, who have been working at Mabtech for uh, quite some time and have done plenty of Alice spots and floor spots. So they're happy to take some questions now. So I'll stop sharing here. There we go. And uh, yeah, like I said, feel free to keep uh, posting your questions in here on the side. I see that some have already come in. And, or you can also post them in the Q&A as well. Uh, but yeah, so let's uh, get started with uh, some questions, Niklas and Christian. And yeah, so let's start with uh, these first questions that are coming up here in the chat. Um, post ethanol, can you use PBS rather than sterile water to wash? I suppose you can, as long as the PBS is sterile. I've accidentally done it and it worked fine for me. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was an easy one. Uh, but yeah, let's see, how long do you leave the washing solution between washes? Less than a minute, uh, two, three, five minutes each? Uh, any, of the, any of the above. And sometimes I, uh, I have left it for hours, actually. Okay, so for like each step. I've, I've, done, I've, done like, I've done four washes. And then uh, I have to do something. Yeah, I have to go get detection antibodies mm. or for some reason. And then I leave in the fourth wash for yeah, 25 minutes. And then I come back mm. to the fifth wash and then I continue on. So, But, but what, we, what you want to achieve is to sort of, you, you, when you empty your ethanol, uh, you, you want to sort of wash in order to dilute the ethanol. So... So every wash you do sort of dilutes the ethanol. Mm. So time is not of the essence. You mm. can do it sort of fairly quickly if you just yeah. do a number of repeated washes. Mm. Yeah, and if I can add there, I mean, just as soon as you, you've added all of the wash to the plate, I mean, that's enough. You can decant it right yeah, away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since you're absolutely. doing this five times. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's really up to you sort of your... Uh, like I said, you, how you, you do things in the lab. And it also, if you have an automatic plate washer, then that can be even longer sometimes. Uh, but yeah, but let's go to the next question. Uh, we experienced some wells that have a total bright out. 
usually in the middle of the plate. Is this due to issues with ethanol or incomplete uh, fluorescent enhancer removal? Uh, over but not tapping onto paper towels made no difference to uh, tap and had more fibers. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, I experienced this myself when I started doing fluorospot. Mm. And I often believe that it was related to the fluorescent enhancer. But I couldn't really figure out what I was doing wrong. Uh, but after I'd done the assay a few times, I just they just disappeared. Okay. And so I think it's a it's it's a lot of factors contributing. But one thing that I do think plays an important part is this: uh, you don't want to leave the membrane exposed to air for long periods of time. Mm. So if you decant the plate and then you start preparing your next round of detection antibodies. Uh, then the membrane runs the risk of becoming a little bit dried out. Mm. And that sort of changes the composition of the membrane uh, from there on end. And uh, I, I, I just think that is a, a major hurdle. When you suddenly get better and better results in flowers, but my suspicion is that you, you simply uh, work more efficiently and smoother during the development process. Mm. But <laughs> it's just a hunch. I, I definitely, if you leave too much fluorescent enhancer in the wells, you can get this very strange uh, blowout effect. Mm. But uh, it's not only that. <laughs> yeah, there are other things that can go wrong as well. Yeah, I mean, if it's uh, if there's some brightness in the middle, it also could be that the plates weren't completely dry before reading as well. Um, so maybe try reading a day later uh, if you can wait. I know it's really fun to get right to your data. Uh, but trying to read the plate maybe a day later could also, uh, that could be reduced. Um, but yeah, but we'll go to the next question then. Uh, you mentioned not have a shaking incubator, uh, but can we employ a north, south, east, west movement of the plate before leaving stationary in the incubator? I, I think the important thing is that the, when you sort of pipe it, and, and uh, like Tyler said, that uh, it's good to pipe it medium and, and control medium and, and uh, steamily before the cells. And, and when you have piped it, the cells will start to sediment down. And when you put them in the incubator, they, they shouldn't sort of, you shouldn't move the plate. Because if you move it sort of hastily, you might sort of mm. move the cells around and, and sort of, and if the cells secre have secreted interferon gamma, and continues to do it in another place, you will get sort of mm. strange results. I, I, I'm not really sure what north, south, east, west movement. I wonder if maybe tilting the plate like this after you've added, if I'm uh, interpreting that correctly. They say that it's uh, going back and forth like this uh, before it uh, becomes stationary in the in the incubator. Yeah, you and definitely shouldn't uh, move it like this. You should not move it like that. No, yeah. no. But, you, should keep, you should keep it flat and just put it carefully in the incubator. Yeah. And that's something to make sure it might be worthwhile making sure that your incubators are level. Uh, because I've seen sometimes where there have been incubators that are a little tilted, or I've seen sometimes people put their plates in at an angle, and then all the cells are going to be shoved down to one side as well. So like Nicholas said, I mean, making sure that it's flat is important. Yeah, you can shake it with a water pass. Exactly. Uh, but then this next question, is it the same 25,000 frequency for antigen-specific cells? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the uh, question. I, I mean, really rare antigen-specific T cells uh, end up being around maybe uh, 10, 20 spots per 250,000 PBMCs. Mm -hmm. Could that be something that they refer to? Uh, could be. Uh, yeah, I would say if you look for antigen specific T cells, you would usually try to use at least a couple of hundred thousand cells. Yeah. And and uh, and you can actually, you can use up to half a million cells in wells. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then the next question if leaving overnight or longer, should we leave the lid on upside down to dry out in a drawer or leave them separately? 
Uh, oh, when they dry the plates after yeah. the assay is done, they, mm -hmm. they can just put it, uh, take off the lid and put them upside down in a, mm -hmm. in a uh, hood. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't put them into a drawer until they're completely dry, just to help yeah. improve air circulation there. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually uh, just had a sort of uh, a person that sent us really strange pictures. Uh, of it was early spot mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the only conclusion we could say that was probably they weren't dry yeah and and a couple of days later they sort of reanalyzed them and mm -hmm. it looked fine mm -hmm. so reading the plates when it's still wet is not good no okay and the last question uh here from uh, Samoyi is uh how long are how long are stable and stable are 490 and 550 for if switching from the iris to AID or switching to iris from AID? Yeah, I think the 550 lasts incredibly long time. I mean, I've taken out plates that are six months old and the 550 still looks really great. Mm -hmm. uh, 490 do degrade. And I would say that uh, uh, for one month, they look really, really good. But mm. uh, if you take out the three months old uh, plate, uh, the 490 has degraded mm. for sure. Yeah. The, the advantage of, of iris is, of course, that you read it and, and you get sort of the signal in a raw spot format. Mm. So uh, if it looks really bright and you, you want it to look better, the signal is there, still there. It doesn't matter if it looks really bright or not. But if you want it to sort of be a more presentable picture, you can just sort of uh, uh, pull down the, the brightness a little bit. But with a reader where you don't read it in a raw spot, if it's too bright, you have to reread it. Mm -hmm. You have to reanalyze it. And, and if you do that a couple of times, it, it might start to affect the, mm -hmm. uh, the signal from the fluorophores. Yeah, I think that was my biggest thing when I switched to the iris. I was amazed that I only ever had to read the plate once uh, because I was never good at getting like the optimal uh, exposure settings and contrast settings uh, mm -hmm. so I could even start analyzing the data. Uh, it so doesn't really, really matter with iris. Exactly. Because the signal is there. Yeah. If it looks really bright on the screen, it, it's just sort of the appearance on the screen and you can just adjust it. Yeah. And it doesn't change your signal. Yeah. Uh, so nice. Okay, but then uh, let's get into some of these uh, Q&A questions that have coming, been coming in. Uh, here we have one. Uh, would you also suggest using anti-CD28 when testing for quicker cytokines or more so in the case of slower ones? I think CD8 is, uh, I mean, when you do flow cytometry, you very often use CD8 and also some other co-stimulatory antibody. But in an in L-spot, you don't really need to use it. Uh, but of course, you can use it to mm -hmm. enhance responses. But with fluorospot, I think CD8 is important if you have, in particular, if you look for IL-2 together with some other cytokine. And, and uh, it doesn't really matter if the other cytokine is slower, quicker, like interferon gamma is a cytokine that is produced quite rapidly, but it can still be affected by capture of IL-2. Mm. And IL-5 is a cytokine that is a bit slower in terms of kinetics. And, and uh, there you, you actually can't analyze IL-2 and IL-5 at the same time. And it doesn't mm. matter if you add CD28. But we have, a, and maybe you mentioned that, we, we have a nice sort of table where we have looked at sort of capture effects, not for all combinations of, of cytokines, obviously, but right. for, for many of the most common ones. And you can see if you, you can anticipate capture effects or not. But IL-2, together with something else, then CD28 is a pretty good advice to use. Mm. Nice. Uh, next question here for fluorus spots and LS spots. Is, is there any practical difference between iris and iris two? We have an iris one. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's uh, it's no real big differences. Um, we have uh, 
uh, a specialized custom lens in Iris 2, which leads to 5% better performance in LED 380. And LED 380 is only used in four color fluorospot kits. But Iris 1 is still a fabulous reader. Mm. Yes, it is. Uh, nice. Next question here, then. Uh, hi. hi. <laughs> How good is the quantitative power of the spot intensity or size? Yes. So the, the algorithm that we employ in our readers, um, uh, for fluorospot, we, uh, we take the spot intensity and the size and, and calculate the volume. And we call that relative spot volume. And the quantitative power of that is really great. It's uh, if you have a if you have a spot volume that is doubled, you can be very sure that we have doubled the amount of cytokine released from that cell. Mm. However, the, the 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 crux of the matter is that we don't have a cell standard. We don't have a cell secreting a known quantity of cytokine, so that we can sort of uh, compare the spot values achieved in fluorospot with known quantities of released mm. cytokine. So we call it relative spot, uh, spot volume. Uh, we don't call it quantitative. Mm. Uh, for ELA spot, we provide the, the relative spot volume as well, but there, the, there is a lack of linearity in ELA spot because of how substrate develops spots. The spot development is not linear. Mm. So it has... Uh, it is less uh, fabulous there. Yeah. OK, nice. Uh, let's see, next question we have here is how to deal with adherent or super sticky cells like macrophages in your sample? Uh, you, you can actually run spot or fluorospot with, with uh, adherent cells. But there are also measures you can take to get rid of uh, adherent cells by washing them with very cold PBS and things like that. Mm. And there are protocols for that. But but uh, yeah, it might be surprising that adherent cells doesn't block the accessibility to the membrane. But uh, you can actually run tests with, with adherent cells. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we have a protocol in, our, in the Knowledge Hub, actually, on our website uh, with uh, how to, or some small things that you can change in your protocol uh, when working with adherent cells. And it's basically just adding some EDTA uh, for, mm. or for uh, like 15 or 20 minute incubation period uh, in that final wash. Um, so feel free to check out the Knowledge Hub on our website as well. Mm. Uh, Another question here, uh, the stimuli to induce memory B cells are also toxic to circulating plasma cells. How do you circumvent this problem? Sorry, I, I, I didn't get that. So the stimuli to induce memory B cells are also toxic to circulating plasma cells. How do you circumvent this problem? Uh, when you stimulate with, with uh, like the way we do it to induce memory B cells, uh, to become sort of plasma blast is, is to sort of incubate with IL-2 and R848. Mm. Mm. And uh, that usually works great. But if you have strongly activated, in vivo activated cells, uh, then the addition of, of uh, IL-2 and R848 may be sort of negative for those cells mm. and, and sort of have a negative effect as, as indicated in the question. Mm. So, I, I mean, it's usually sort of, if you want to sort of compare uh, in vivo activated plasma cells and memory cells, you have to set up sort of uh, parallel assays yeah, because the plasma cells you would be able to see without adding any stimuli. But the memory cells, you would see only if you activate them. So, so uh, ideally, you would, you would sort of do both of these variants in, in, in parallel, where you, in one case, looking at plasma cells, and you just take the cells, and you put them into your, your uh, fluorospot or L-spot plate well, and, and uh, analyze them. 
And with memory cells, you pre-stimulate them for three, four, five days before mm. doing the assay. Yeah. And this is actually exactly what I did uh, for one of my PhD projects, looking at the yellow fever responses. I did a, uh, I did a fluorospot to look at plasma blast responses in those first early time points. Uh, but then I also took a portion of the cells and stimulated them for four days with the uh, IL-2 R848. And so then, I mean, so then I was looking at the memory B cell responses and when those arose. So it's looking at two different questions as well. Yeah, and the plasma cells after, if you sort of have a very potent vaccine, mm. they, they sort of start to secrete antibodies after like three, four days or something, and they do it, but they sort of disappear from circulation after yeah. maybe two weeks or three weeks. Mm. And then you, you have to look for memory cells. Yeah. But ideally, you would sort of do it in parallel. Yeah. So nice. I could talk about B cells all day, but let's go to the <laughs> next question. Uh, so for tuplex, uh, which one has a better sensitivity, dual color, enzymatic, or fluorescence? That's, I would say, uh, definitely fluorescence. Um, dual color, I, there's one application maybe where you can use it, and it's if you look for, for example, you have coated an antigen and you look for B cells secreting IgA and IgM or IgA or IgG, that, that could work because you don't have dual secreting cells. They secrete either IgA or IgG. Right. But if you look for T cells, the dual color enzymatic assay, is a, it's a horrible assay because you, you, you get red and blue spots. And if they're double colored, you would think that they would be purple. But if they, they are a little bit stronger in red or a little bit stronger in blue, mm. you can't sort of you can't really tell. But with, with fluorescent uh, analysis, it's easy. Mm. And I also have a whole blog post discussing why we don't like and don't recommend a dual color LSBOT. Yeah, and it's not only the sort of final results, it's also the fact that first you sort of develop with one substrate, right. and then you add another uh, enzyme with another pH that affects the first one. So mm. it's a complicated assay, and, and the results you get from it and the data you get from it is, is not good. No. So Nice. Okay, we have time for one more question. We have one more here in the comments. Uh, any advice on how to differentiate dust or small tip contamination uh, signal versus a genuine spot for masking? Uh, generally, spots has a certain uh, bell-shaped property to them in that you have a brighter core and uh, uh, less bright edges and that you can look with this in iris by playing with the brightness setting. Whereas uh, artifacts tend to be a very sharp edges that are not bell shaped. Mm. Yeah, nice. Uh, we actually have got some more questions really quick. Uh, do you get the same sensitivity on multiplex fluorospot than LSPOT when you're looking at several analytes and separate? It it's uh, it depends a little bit. I mean, if you use the same antibodies in LSPOT and fluorospot, you would expect to get the same sensitivity. But then it also depends on what amplification system you have. In LSPOT, you usually use a biotinylated antibody and streptavidin with an enzyme, and it's a very mm -hmm. potent method. And with, with, uh, with uh, fluorospot, it depends a little bit on what amplification system do you have and how good is that, and also the depends on, on what fluorophore you use, uh, like the 550 is stronger than 380, for example. So, so uh, they're not sort of always 100% comparable, but overall, it, you can expect to get a very similar sensitivity. Mm. All right, and one final question, if we can go a minute over, because I think this is a really important question. Uh, Somewhere it was mentioned that the viability should be more than 90%. Uh, this is feasible for freshly isolated cells, not so much for samples stored in liquid nitrogen. Normally they end up with 80 to 85%, sometimes worse. Uh, will that be a problem in fluorospot? And is there a cutoff for viability? I think when you do cellular assays and you work with sort of cells that have 
been frozen and thought it's it's uh, you have the same problem all the time. The less viability, the less good results you will get. So I think it's maybe if you sort of buy a ready to use kit for Florespot, there is nothing really that should go technically wrong. So the, the most important thing is the quality of your cells. Mm. So checking viability and keeping track of that, that's of, of essence. And 90% and, uh, is good. Mm. And once you go below 90, if you go down to 70, 60, the, the worse your results are going to get. Mm. So, so getting good protocols for, for freezing down your cells and also how to thaw them and wash them. That's maybe the most critical uh, thing for a, a cellular-based assay, I would say. There has been this landmark study by Merck in uh, 2005 or something where they looked at that a lot and came to the conclusion that 84% viability was really important to be above. When they dropped below 84% viability, you really got started having, uh, you, you, you lost antigen specific responding donors mm. that you knew were antigen specific. Uh, you, they should have a positive response. And when you went below 80%, it was like it went off a cliff, actually. Mm. It was really dramatic. And uh, when we at MobTech isolate from fresh blood, we uh, put them in freeze media, we freeze it and then we thaw it uh, one week later or uh, 10 years later. I mean, we always get above 95% viability. I, my, I personally have always gotten around 98% viability. So if uh, you're only getting 90 or 85, 80, there's something bad going on somewhere. And uh, we should have a seminar on that specifically, it, I guess. Yeah, we actually have a great, uh, we have our protocols about how we do things at MapTech uh, available on the website for cell isolation, freezing and thawing. Uh, yeah. So take a, take a look at that. Um, and, and the Merck I article, I have it somewhere. I have it somewhere. I, I okay, we'll there get that to you, Avinash. Yeah, yeah you, you can't emphasize enough how important it is yeah. to get good viability of your cells when you work with frozen and thawed cells. Yeah. yeah. So perfect. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Christian and Niklas. And thank you to all the participants for all of your excellent questions. This was a really fun uh, Q&A session. Um, so uh, yeah, like I said, this uh, was recorded and it'll be sent out to you guys uh, probably next week in a follow-up email. Uh, if there are any questions that uh, we didn't get to or uh, you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us or your local account manager um, and they'll get you in touch with the right person and. Uh, we'll be able to answer those questions for you. So thanks again for joining us today and we'll keep in touch.